So again, this Bethel Bible series journey now takes us to join the Apostle Peter. And if you remember anything about Peter, he was kind of the leader of the disciples. Um, Some might have said um, he thought more of a leader than he should have. But um, in any case, uh, Peter uh, wrote letters to some of his churches, and this one addresses the church in particular issues of the day. And he addresses the church, which is now in modern Turkey today. And it's about being born anew, a new creature, just like in baptism, where the old is past and gone, okay? It's that old self, and it's fading, and the new has come, and the new self that is more and more like Christ is emerging. So to be able to teach this well, we're going to listen to the Bible Project video to give us a good foundation of this great book in the Bible. The first letter of Peter. His name was Shimon, or Simon, when he first became a follower of Jesus, and he was part of the inner circle of the 12 disciples. When he made his confession that Jesus was the Messiah, Jesus changed his name to Kephas, which is Aramaic for rock, which was later translated into Greek as Petros, or Peter. Jesus promised that he would become a leader among the apostles to guide the Messianic community in Jerusalem through its earliest years, and that's what happened. Remember the early chapters of the book of Acts. Eventually, Peter was called to carry the good news of Jesus beyond the borders of Israel, however, and this letter was written decades into that mission in the wider Roman world. We discover at the conclusion of this letter that Peter is in Rome, which he calls Babylon, and we learn that while Peter commissioned the letter, it was actually composed by a man named Silvanus, who was a co-worker of Peter. This was a circular letter sent to multiple church communities in the Roman province of Asia Minor, which is in modern-day Turkey, and Peter learned that these mostly non-Jewish Christians were persecuted. They were facing hostility and harassment from their Greek and Roman neighbors. And so Peter wrote to encourage them in the midst of their suffering. And this helps explain the letter's design and its main themes. It opens with a greeting, and then it moves into a poetic song of praise to God, which introduces the key themes that are explored in the main body of the letter, where he first affirms the new family identity of these persecuted Christians, which will help them see their suffering as a way to bear witness to Jesus. And this has a way of focusing their future hopes on the return of Jesus. Let's dive in. You'll just see how all the pieces work together. So Peter opens by greeting these churches as the church chosen people of God who are exiled around the world. Now, Peter makes clear throughout the letter that these Christians he's writing to are Gentiles, but here he describes them with phrases from the Old Testament that describe how God chose the people of Israel, the family of Abraham, who was himself an exile and wanderer. This is a key strategy that Peter repeats through the whole letter. He wants these suffering non-Jewish Christians to see that through Jesus, they now belong to the family of Abraham. And so they're wandering exiles just like him, misunderstood, they're mistreated, and they're looking for their true home in the promised land. Peter continues this idea in the opening song. He praises God for causing people to be born again into a living hope through Jesus' resurrection and the power of the Spirit. God's inviting all people into a new family centered around Jesus, a family that has a new identity as God's beloved children and who have a new hope of a world reborn by God's love when Jesus returns as King. And for people who have this hope, suffering and persecution is actually a strange gift because it burns away false hopes and distractions like a purifying fire, and it reminds us of our true home and hope. And so paradoxically, life's hardships actually deepen our faith. They make it more genuine. From here, Peter's going to move on into the body of the letter, but he's going to explore all these ideas in greater depth. So he first develops the theme about the new family identity of God's people. He takes even more memorable Old Testament images about the family of Israel, and then he applies them to these Gentile Christians. So like the Israelites who left Egypt, they too are to gird up their loins and leave behind their former way of life on the way to a new future. So they are the holy people of God now who are journeying through the wilderness. They are the people of the new Exodus who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus, who's the ultimate Passover lamb. They are the people of the new covenant who have God's word buried deep inside them, restoring their hearts and renewing their minds. They are the new temple built on the foundation of Jesus himself, and they're the new kingdom of priests who are serving God as his representatives to the nations. Now, by applying all of these amazing images to these 
persecuted Gentile Christians, Peter is placing their suffering within a brand new story. And this leads into the next section. Their persecution can actually help bring clarity to their mission in the world, to bear witness to God's mercy among the nations. So Peter first encourages them to submit to Roman rule, even if it's oppressive. Yes, he acknowledges their persecution, their suffering is unjust. But violent resistance solves nothing, not to mention that it betrays the teachings of Jesus who loved his enemies instead of killing them. Peter then specifically highlights the very difficult situation that Christian slaves and wives faced when they lived in Roman households where the patriarch did not follow Jesus. The problem was that it was expected that everyone in the household would submit to and worship the patriarch's gods. And so Peter's aware that giving allegiance to Jesus will generate suspicion. So Peter says, it's true. All Christians, including Roman wives and slaves, have been fully liberated by Jesus. But they are to demonstrate that freedom, not through rebellion, but by resisting evil the same way Jesus did, through showing love and generosity to your enemies. And in homes where the husband is also a Christian, it's a different story. They are to treat their wives totally different from their Roman neighbors, regarding them as equals before God who are worthy of honor and respect. And Peter's hopeful that this imitation of Jesus' love and upside-down kingdom will give power to their words as they bear witness to God's mercy and show people the beautiful truth about the way of Jesus. But Peter's also a realist. He knows that Christians will continue to be persecuted, and so he reminds them of their future vindication. He recalls how Jesus himself was was unfairly persecuted and murdered by corrupt human powers. But in reality, he was dying for the sins of his enemies. And afterward, he was vindicated and given resurrection life by the Spirit. And now Jesus is exalted as king over all human and spiritual powers. Then Peter shows how baptism points to the vindication of Jesus' followers. So like Noah, they've been saved through the waters, not as a magic ritual, but as a sacred symbol that shows their change of heart, their desire to be joined to Jesus in his death and his resurrection. And so now, even if they are murdered for following Jesus, their hope is in future vindication and exaltation alongside their king. Which leads Peter into the final movement. He recalls Jesus' words that his disciples should consider it an honor and joy to be persecuted just like he was. Peter then calls on church leaders to care for these suffering Christians and to show the same kind of servant leadership that Jesus did to his followers. And finally, Peter reminds these Christians about the real enemy that they are facing. This hostility isn't simply cultural or even political. There are dark forces of spiritual evil at work inspiring hatred and violence and they are to resist this evil by staying faithful to Jesus and his teachings and by anticipating his return and ultimate victory over such evil. Peter concludes with a prayer for divine strength, and he sends a greeting from the church in Rome, which he calls Babylon. Now, this is cool. Peter's adopting here the tradition of the Old Testament prophets for whom the name Babylon became an archetype for any and every corrupt nation. And so Rome has become the new Babylon, and its empire is where God's people are now exiled from their true home in the renewed creation. Peter's first letter is a powerful reminder of Christian hope in the midst of suffering. God's people have been a misunderstood minority from the very beginning, and they should expect to face hostility because they've chosen to live under the rule of a different king, Jesus. However, persecution can become a strange gift to the church because it offers a chance to show others the surprising generosity and love of Jesus, which is fueled by the hope of his return. And that's what 1 Peter is all about. Isn't that great? Cool. Amazing. It ties in so well today, the emphasis on baptism as well. Okay, now I want to go to our context. Here we are. We are Americans living the dream. Compared to much of the world, we as Americans are so very blessed. We have it really good. If you were even to study your ancestors and where they came from and how simple life was back then and how hard and the suffering, we've got it really good. In many ways, the American way, though, is also typically about avoiding pain and suffering and rather about the pursuit of happiness. Therefore, we in these generations are looking for comfort, for ease, for pleasure, excitement, cool stuff, yummy food, and potent drinks. Yet in our pursuit of all these things, we suffer, and many suffer greatly. Most spend more than they earn. 
As we know, 78% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck and may not have $400 at the bank to pay for a sudden emergency like a car repair. So we're stressed out. Comparatively to other nations in the world, Americans work many more hours in their work week that has led to higher rates of burnout, stress, and health complications. And we're seeing some rebellion in our society right now where they're going, hey, you know, I kind of like this change. COVID has put me at home. I have less stress. Hey, maybe we can negotiate. And if you look at how we live with our massive homes, our multiple expensive cars, our multiple closets filled with clothes and time that it takes to upkeep all our stuff, it gets to be a bit overwhelming. Americans also boast higher rates of heart issues, cancer, aches and pains, and all sorts of health ailments than most of the world. Great. Folks, something is just not right here. We're obviously not finding what we're looking for. It's that pursuit of the good life that has led us down the road of, of the complicated, stressed out, painful and suffering kind of life, precisely what we were trying to run away from. And again, in many ways, we sing to ourselves, and let's, let, let's hear it now, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. No, you two fans? Oh, bummer. In Jesus' day, particularly throughout the Mediterranean Sea area where Greco-Roman influence was most prominent, people were looking for or pursuing the newest and best philosophy and gods that would give them life, that would give them peace and happiness. Oh, they were certainly seeking and finding all sorts of pleasures too, as licentiousness, party on dudes, was going on all over the place, which led to the apostles to admonish and help them clean up their act if their witness for Jesus was either going to be a dim or bright light pointing to Christ. To be clear, the purpose of life is not about avoiding pain and suffering. Pain and suffering are just a reality in life as broken, sinful human beings, living in a world that's really a mess, isn't it? Living particularly as Christians, followers of Jesus in the world, will also involve suffering. But perhaps a better kind of suffering, or at least suffering with a purpose. As our Bethel Bible series binder reads in chapter 17 on 1 Peter, it says this, those who equate a faithful life in Christ with an absence of pain, suffering, and struggle, ignore the clear message of 1 Peter. Life as a follower of Jesus is anything but easy. The New Testament community recognized that Christianity was not a peace of mind cult, which promised the people totally freedom from suffering, pain, or tension. On the contrary, the early believers' understanding of a right relationship with God assumed suffering to be part of that relationship. People will suffer, says 1 Peter, not because they have failed to embrace the God revealed in Christ, but precisely because they have embraced him. Christians can expect to suffer because they are Christians. Now, most of us think that by simply believing in Jesus as our Savior, believing this work on the cross to forgive our sins is it. In other words, if we believe this, all is well. Well, faith is more than that, as we know. Even the devil believed that Jesus died for people's sins. And yet there's a transformational work that is going on within us and through us. And that's through the work of the Holy Spirit, as we heard about in baptism. And sometimes this happens in an instant. You see some lives transform. All of a sudden, they, they learn about Jesus. They never heard of Jesus before. They're shared the gospel, and suddenly their life changes radically in an instant. Sometimes it takes a little while, and it's a process for months, years, and perhaps decades. This process is a fancy word called sanctification, or becoming holy, set apart, becoming more like Jesus. 
So Peter tells these believers, and he writes in, I, I think it's um, chapter 2, but maybe it's chapter 1, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires that you had when you lived in ignorance, before you were a Christian, but just as you who are called holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy, because I am holy. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Now, I believe Peter's words here are not a suggestion or a high recommendation. This is a command. If you look at the Greek, it's a word that is command. If you say you are a Christian, then reflect Christ. Be like Jesus. Be holy, sober, clean, compassionate, loving, peaceful, and kind. And that's different. Different than many people in the world who are pursuing other pleasures. So let's turn to a few people that we know of in the Bible and their issues. Now, I could go down a whole toilet paper roll list, but I only selected a few based on the Bethel Bible series. And these are people just like you and me, folks. So don't put them in a different category. They're just like us, okay? And it's that old nature, as the apostles Peter and Paul talk about, that old way of life that sometimes creeps back into us, and, and that contrast from that to being born anew in Christ, that is called the process of sanctification. So listen to some of their pursuits of pleasures and comforts and independence that led a few people in the Bible to their demise. And I'm not going to expand on these situations, but you got Adam and Eve, right? They got the whole turf. And God just says, you know, just, just not this, you know, don't touch that, okay? But what did they do? They touched it, right? And they wanted independence. They wanted to know everything. They wanted to have everything God had. And of course, they broke the vow. Or you got Noah using good things for the wrong ends. Um, Noah, if you didn't know this, he was, you know, he worked the soil and he planted a vineyard. And when he drank some of its wine, he became drunk. And there's more details, but I won't go into that. Or you've got Lot. Now, you've heard about Lot he ended up with some serious um, land, and, um, and some of it not so good after all. But it says here in Genesis 13, Abram and Lot, okay, they're related. Um, they're divvying up the land, and Abram says to Lot, he said, Hey, let's not have any quarreling between you and me, or between your herders or mine, for we are close relatives. Is not the whole land before you? Um, and so let's part company. If you go... You know, for example, take the left and I'll go to the right. Or if you go to the right, and I'll, I'll go to the left. Well, Lot selfishly chose the best. He took the well-watered and land and left the other stuff to his relative. Though he ended up with Sodom and Gomorrah, and that went really well, right? It led to his demise. Esau gave away his birthright to Jacob over what? Just a mess of stew, right? Saul putting personal ambition before godliness. I guess Saul was teased because David took out more, uh, more enemies than, than Saul, and so he wanted to get back after him, and you know the attempts for his life. And then David, permitting lust and unbridled passions, uh, ruled him as he was checking out Bathsheba, which led to all sorts of sins down the road, murder among others. And, and it just leads us to recognize that we all have selfish sinful moments that have led to our demise at times. And the key thing is for us to name those moments, to recognize those, and give them to the Lord. Turn them to the Lord in prayer. And in a sense, just like we did earlier, I renounce them. I renounce the evil. I renounce the sin. And, and Lord, take this from me so that I may be made new in the waters of baptism and rise in that newness of life. And so our confession time that we usually do at the beginning of the service is going to be now. And it's meant for us to examine our lives thoroughly and to admit our sins before God, to own it, to admit we are sinners in need of a Savior. And it's a great way to start the day fresh. I know this is Saturday evening service, but it, it's, 
in the moment of confession and sins, and even sharing our hurts with God, that we receive in that moment that undeserved grace and forgiveness from God that we call absolution, that we can go about our day born anew. The old is gone, the new has come. So Peter has all sorts of verses on this. I'm going to highlight a few from page 205. So if you're there at 1 Peter on page 205, we're at verse, chapter 1, verse 22, and it says this, Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying, this is such a critical thing, is obeying the truth of God so that you have sincere love for each other. Today I was at a, a men's conference called No Regrets, and the key words that the lead speaker said Ultimately, discipleship is obedience and love. Are you obeying, obeying what Jesus told you to do? And are you loving one another? Those are the true signs of discipleship. So as he said, by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for one another, love one another deeply from the heart. For you've been born again, not a perishable seed, but have been perishable through the loving in living and enduring word of God. And then he goes to verse 2, or chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, rid yourself of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Verse 9, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you did not receive mercy, now you have received mercy. And then in my Bible it says, on living godly lives in a pagan society, Peter writes this, dear friends, Friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, I urge you, as foreigners and exiles, in other words, we as Christians on this earth, we do not belong here. We are children of God, children of a heavenly world we can anticipate. But Peter is direct, and while you are here, you are to abstain from sinful desires, which wage war on your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans, meaning the unbelievers, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Remember that moment. Friends, if you haven't identified and admitted your sins in detail lately, here's an exhaustive list if you want to take that home with you. <laughs> I know, it's huge, it's huge. But the problem of living in our postmodern culture is often anything goes. And in our culture, we kind of dismiss everything and just go, well, it's just the way it is, and, and so be it. But it harms people. And so what we need to do as Christians is call a spade a spade, a sin a sin. So we're going to take some time now and come to the Lord in a humble spirit of confession, saying to God, I ask your forgiveness and cleansing for these sins that I name before you now in the silence of my heart. And believe me, God will do something. I confessed some sins and, worked, and turned it over to the Lord so many months ago, and God cleansed me of the sin. And it's amazing. So let's pray with expectation that God will do something. And we're going to join in the good old LBW. Remember that green book? We're going to join in those words because it comes from the Bible. So let us pray together. Most merciful God, everyone, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen.
In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you, and for his sake, God forgives you all your sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. Now let's get deeper. Come to him, the Lord, naming those sins. Let's, let's pray. Lord, we come to you now to truly name those specific sins that hinder our love for you and our love of people. And Lord, we ask for your forgiveness and cleansing of these sins that we name before you now in the silence of our hearts. Lord, thank you for listening to us as we've shared maybe some of our greatest struggles and sins with you. You are our creator, our redeemer, our savior, and friend, Jesus. We give you thanks for the forgiveness that we can live in and rise in newness of life in your name. Amen. So receive the absolution. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you. And for his sake, God forgives you all your sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. Amen. Here's what Martin Luther writes. He says this, Confession consists of two parts. One is that we confess our sins. The other is that we receive absolution or forgiveness from the confessor as from God himself. By no means doubting, but for firmly believing that our sins are thereby forgiven before God in heaven. We need to believe this, that we are forgiven and live in that new life. And so as forgiven children of God, we're saved by grace, not by works, but by faith given to us by God. However, we were created in Christ Jesus to do good works that God planned in advance for us to do. And so like at this conference today, it said if there's a prompting, if you feel the Spirit's prompting, I'm going to, supposed to go do something, you're supposed to say yes, Lord. But it's the times when we don't say yes that something doesn't happen, that good deed is not done, and that person's life isn't touched or changed or given mercy or compassion. And so we need to say, yes, Lord. Simply said, it's all about doing good. This is how Peter expresses it. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. If they speak poorly of you because you're a Christian, just do good. It will silent people. Live as free people, but not to use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's servants. Show proper respect to everyone. That was a key message today, too. When we speak poorly of people, when we're angry at people, when we treat people bad, we lose all our witness. And that's a critical thing in the society that's happening. I get with some friends and they do similar things and I need to speak this truth with them. And so it says, Peter says, show proper respect to everyone. It's the only opportunity you have for influence to maybe help them see truth is by respecting and loving them. And he goes on, it says, love the family of believers, revere God, and honor the emperor. Isn't that what happened? Verse 19, for it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it that, you, that to your credit, if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it, 
But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps, that you should walk in the way of Jesus, be like Jesus, love like Jesus. And so I go to slide 18. In this chapter, Peter talks about critically important our witness while suffering for doing right, doing good. Peter writes again, finally, all of you have unity of the Spirit. Okay? It's critical, especially in our churches. We may disagree on some matters, but we still need to be together in unity. And we're supposed to have sympathy and love for one another, a tender heart and a humble mind. He goes on, and do not repay evil for evil or abuse for abuse, but on the contrary, repay with a blessing. It is for this that you were called that you might inherit a blessing. All right, I realize I have all sorts of good stuff from 1 Peter and might be carried away and with little ones all around. I think let's go to slide nine and the trials. And so as you live out your faith, as you continue to do good in a very difficult world and you know the trail of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, come along this journey in the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. And so, in summary, this is it. Is the pursuit of the pleasures and comforts of life, in part, not the whole thing, but in part the American dream, the ultimate philosophy of life that we pursue, or you pursue? Or are you pursuing Jesus as your one pure and holy passion? God has created us for a purpose, to love God with everything we've got and to love people to the max. It's hard work. Yes, there'll be people that we don't really enjoy, to put it lightly, yet God calls us to respect and love them. There is joy in the journey, and there will be suffering. There will be trials, and there will be some kind of persecution but we continue to persevere and do good for Jesus' sake. Amen.